Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Vise, and welcome to this uh, webinar on bridging the gap, delivering health equity for BAME communities. This is part of the Together for Health series of events being hosted by Dodds. Now, the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on BAME communities has again highlighted difficult issues around uh, inequality and discrimination, which we have struggled to face up to for many years. In particular, it has underlined stark inequalities in health outcomes, barriers in access to services, and highlighted difficulties and concerns around the relationship between BAM in com communities and institutions such as the NHS. Uh, and we can see evidence for this in the unequal distribution of vaccine hesitancy. Now, this event is being run in collaboration with the Office of the Public Guardian. Now, they're concerned about one in one manifestation of this, which is the low take up among BAME communities of the lasting power of attorney. The Public Guardian, Nick Goodwin, is going to begin our conference with a presentation about his office's perspective on inequalities and what that signifies about the wider issues. And then our expert panel will be discussing the underlying causes and potential solutions around these issues of inequity. Now we've got uh, uh, some hundreds of people on the call today. We're very pleased to see you all and we'd be really keen for you to contribute your questions and comments um, in the uh, question and answer function on the uh, platform Glissa. So do please contribute and I will put those questions and thoughts uh, to our expert panel. So to, to begin with, uh, Nick, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, and, and thanks to everyone for being here today. Um, as Richard says, I am uh, Nick Goodwin. I'm the Public Guardian from uh, England and Wales. Uh, other Public Guardians are available in Scotland, Northern Ireland, uh, but we're doing England and Wales today. Um, and I think if we go on to the next slide, I'll just sort of introduce um, what it is we do. Um, I'm hoping many of you are familiar with it. But the Public Guardian operates under the Mental uh, Capacity Act. We are concerned uh, about those that uh, lack mental capacity, and we operate within that framework. As I say, we are we are about England and Wales. We do two, three uh, key things. The first is um, we register lasting powers of attorney, and also the old form of that, enduring powers of attorney, an instrument that allows someone to plan for the future, that allows someone to say, should I lose mental capacity, I would like the following person or persons to make decisions on my behalf and people make those decisions within the ambit of the act. So their best interest decisions, they involve the person uh, concerned, should they have fluctuating mental capacity or, or should they be able to uh, uh, pass their wishes and feeling over. Uh, so that is that is part of the framework. Um, it's an empowering thing for people to be able to, to do. Um, when a lasting power of attorney is not taken out, then um, the, the legal limbo people find themselves in in respect of decisions on their property or finance or health and welfare often results in the court granting uh, others an equivalent power uh, under what's known as a deputyship. Um, those powers are often more constrained. Uh, they come, of course, with a court fee and a supervision fee. And we at the uh, Office of the Public Guardian uh, supervise those deputies to make sure that they are doing um, what they said they would do, i.e. make best uh, interest decisions. We also investigate concerns. So if deputies or attorneys um, are doing something wrong or suspected of doing something wrong, we will look into that. Thankfully, those concerns are not widespread, uh, but where they are, we conduct a thorough investigation and take uh, cases to court. So that's the, the, the high level background. If we move on, I'll just give you um, a little bit of a take on um, mental capacity context. And um, there's some content on the screens for you to look at. Um, and I think most of this will be fairly familiar to you. We clearly have uh, a, a high number of people in our society suffering from a lack of mental capacity. The headline figure of 850,000 people uh, with dementia in the UK is sobering enough. If one considers in the next 19 years, that's likely to li rise to around uh, to, to around 1.6 million, uh, then it's clear this is a huge uh, issue for our society. We have 70% of people uh, in care homes um, with dementia. Um, and unfortunately, um, 
of people with dementia, um, around about um, two thirds of those will um, have Alzheimer's, uh, but there's also vascular dementia. And in the, uh, the context of this debate, I think it's worth highlighting uh, that there is increasing evidence uh, that vascular dementia um, is, uh, is particularly prevalent in the African Caribbean population. I, there's a higher risk of vascular dementia within that population. And unfortunately, it's also true uh, that vascular dementia tends to come uh, to, to the fore earlier uh, within that population. Um, so early onset uh, vascular dementia is, uh, is more prevalent. It's also worth saying that, of course, all this, as well as the costs of care, the, the, the usual costs, um, to society of a uh, uh, lack of capacity are obvious. Uh, the Alzheimer's Society uh, estimate that um, over a million uh, days um, uh, of, of hospital beds are actually taken up by people who lack medical capacity, who could actually um, be out in society. And obviously our role in providing people lasting power attorneys often facilitates people going home early when uh, when their attorneys can talk to them, can speak for them. Um, in the COVID context, um, we've seen that um, uh, in particular, um, when uh, wards were full, um, we responded to a call from NHS and local authorities to actually have uh, quicker information on whether a lasting power of attorney uh, was in existence and we now have a 24-hour turnaround on that and that in turn allowed um, beds to be freed up and we'll continue with that service. Moving on, uh, this is a particularly sobering slide uh, I'm afraid. Um, we at the OPG grant nearly a million lasting power of attorney a year. Uh, unfortunately, when you look at that slide, the blue, dark blue blocks show uh, where where people have a high uptake of lasting power attorney. And broadly speaking, they tend to be uh, the more affluent parts of the country. The the blobs you see, Bradford, Leicester, Birmingham, London, and, and various other areas are where we tend to have um, higher uh, BAME communities. And unfortunately, in the in those areas and in the areas that um, that have um, lower average incomes, we actually see the lowest income, or, sorry, the lowest take up of LPA. So there's a mismatch between need and uh, provision. And that's something um, that I think we have, to, we have to solve and we're working hard on an OPG, but we really appreciate your thoughts on how we can further target our communities. Um, we, we have campaigns, of course, um, the reason we think people aren't taking up lasting power of attorneys, well, we know the top three reasons. Um, firstly, um, quite often people just don't think uh, that the, the issue is relevant to them. They think I'm young, I'm healthy, I don't need a lasting power of attorney. The second uh, reason is too few people actually understand um, what, uh, what the, the benefits of lasting power of attorney and how to access them. And then lastly, uh, people also have attitudinal and emotional barriers that we need to break down. And it won't surprise anyone to hear uh, that men in particular don't, uh, don't think they will, uh, they will lack mental capacity in the future. Unfortunately, um, simply not true. And the reason we need to get this message across is that often in the, um, in the areas where people don't have uh, provision for the future, they often assume that family members um, will be able to look after them. And to a certain extent, of course, they can look after them, but they actually do not have the legal powers to make certain critical decisions for people, health and welfare decisions and financial decisions. So we really need to land the message uh, that getting lasting power of attorney is, is something people should do well in advance of, uh, of losing their capacity. If we um, move, move on now, I'll just say a little bit um, about how you actually... Um, work out uh, whether someone has a lasting power of attorney in existence. I, look, the, the first and most obvious point is ask if people have um, some capacity, they should be able to tell you. And that is, of course, um, incredibly useful. Uh, the second tool I referred to before is that um, NHS and government workers can ask us at the OPG. and We'll do a quick search for you to see whether an LPA is in existence. Also, for LPAs taken out since September 2019, um, you can, in fact, now uh, search online. Um, users can register their lasting power of attorney and then very quickly professionals will be able to understand whether one exists and who uh, in who the powers um, the, the powers are vested. The old-fashioned way of course is to get the lasting power of attorney itself and it's just worth uh, highlighting what you'll see on a valid lasting power of attorney. Uh, 
the validated OPG stamp will be through every single page, and that's a perforated stamp. On the front, you'll also have a, a registration stamp, which is bottom left-hand corner, and a flashy sticker that can't be removed um, without destroying uh, the LPA. If uh, you uh, get the alternative, a, a court order giving someone deputy ship powers, you will see the quarter protection stamp. And it's really important to understand that an LPA is valid. So please do take steps um, to do that. Um, moving swiftly on uh, before my time is up, there's a couple of other things um, I, I should say. Firstly, look, I, I hope I've, I've, I've made clear the benefits. Um, if someone has a lasting power of attorney, obviously it is in their benefit to have the person they have um, asked to help them make decisions to be there, um, to help them make sure they get the treatment they would have wanted, the treatment that's in their best interest, and to help break down communication barriers with healthcare professionals and get those decisions made in a timely manner. And on the other side of fence obviously there are benefits for those um, looking after their care so the last thing i'll just say is how do you how do you get involved how do you, how can you help here which is on the on the next slide um, and the first thing i think on the panel today we have a lpa uh, champion um, and um, we would encourage people to get um, involved in that um, I also ask people to look out for consultation that the Ministry of Justice I think will be launching um, hopefully this spring on lasting power of attorney and frankly how we can make the system uh, better and more modern and more user friendly for people so please do keep an eye out for that um, and we are always here uh, to help answer questions and uh, share uh, feedback uh, tips and guidance when we can um, I think, although we didn't get to my last slide on the uh, on the Zoom thing, uh, that is that is all I wanted to say for now. Um, Baljit from our legal uh, team is going to be on the panel, and I will hang around and help ask questions too. So thank you very much, Richard. Nick, thank you very much for that uh, wide-ranging presentation with some really quite stark data there about the unequal distribution of the uh, the lasting powers across the country. So joining Nick. Uh, for our panel discussion. First of all is Geraldine McMurdy, uh, Jerry, who is the head of intermediate care at HC1, the UK's largest independent care home provider. But Jerry uh, is also a member of the BAME Communities Advisory Group at the Department of Health and Social Care. And she'll be talking us through what that group uh, uncovered in its discussions uh, with professionals and members of the public. And our other panel member is Dr. Edwina uh, Accarelli, who is now a GP after a background in a number of different parts of uh, uh, the NHS and the private sector, uh, not least in surgery. As a GP, uh, Edwina has a particular passion around supporting people to take ownership of their own health and well-being. Uh, Tricia uh, Pariah sadly is unable to join us today. Now, Jerry, if I can come to you first, um, the Communities Advisory Group was established to make recommendations to the social care uh, COVID task force that was set up. The, the government does love a task force, doesn't it? And you did a lot of discussions with um, BAME professionals and service users and members of the public to try to understand what was going on in the underneath the surface of the COVID-19 pandemic and people's experiences. What were your main findings? Yes, thank you and morning everyone. If I can just briefly sort of um, explain how the panel sort of came to or how, how the, the group formed. Uh, I joined the group um, following the co-chairs Tricia Pereira, who sadly couldn't join us today, and, and Sedi Frederick reaching out to some system leaders um, and we had literally two weeks to produce a report. We were the last group to be formed, um, but we were also very committed to make sure we heard the voices of people who were living through this, um, particularly as we were working at PACE and this was in July, August last year. So the first wave had ended um, and obviously we weren't sure what was coming. So what we actually wanted to do was get real feedback from people who lived and worked through this. Obviously we all had our own experiences directly and indirectly working in services. So we had a, an online survey, um, roughly 200 people responded, but we had about three or four days to turn that around. We also had an online event um, and we had around 90 people from up and down the country who were either carers, 
family carers, people who draw on services and also people working in social care from either the, the independent sector or in social services through local authorities. What we did then is produce a report with a number of key recommendations to put forward to, to the government um, as, as clear, clear actions with a very clear message from all those people that we spoke to. Um, so if I can sort of go through those recommendations fairly briskly. Uh, what we said was we wanted the group, the work of the group to continue. We had only really just got started and the very strong message was a lot of people saying this is the first time anyone's asked us about our experiences, particularly in social care. We acknowledge there had been a lot of work in health and one of the biggest overriding messages was the disparity between health and social care workers and people who, who have those services and draw upon those services. The second one was as making sure that people were li with lived experiences were very much on board and involved in shaping future services, how they're commissioned, uh, where they're commissioned to make sure that, that we get services that are cognizant of people's cultural experiences and needs uh, and addresses some of the inequalities. The third recommendation was again to go to look at you know, addressing the, the parity or disparity between staff working in the NHS and social social care. And there were a number of sort of key key kind of flags around that. The difference between access to PPE, the difference between the messaging around around sort of what was safe and, and safe practices. There was a mandate for NHS workers to have a risk assessment, I think, by April. Um, nothing came out of that around social care staff, despite the fact that, as we know, in that first wave, we had people being discharged into care homes who, aren't, who weren't even being tested. Uh, and sadly, we all know that the consequences of that. The fourth recommendation was to, to look at sharing best practice and coordinate advice and support in a more joined up way across health and social care. Uh, Fifth recommendation, which I'm glad to say yesterday we've heard has been acted upon to have research and more accurate data, uh, particularly around social care, which is able to be shared from government to local authorities and the, and the wider sector. Uh, yesterday, there's been uh, an announcement that the University of Birmingham are leading a, a collaborative um, project to have a centre for social social care um, where they will be able to conduct meaningful and, and, and deep research across the sector. The sixth recommendation, which has and again now been acted on, is to have faith and ethnicity recorded on death certificates. There was a big data gap, um, which was evident in, in the public health report, where we weren't able to understand fully in a concrete way that the impact of COVID on um, people from Black and Asian communities, although clearly the, you know our screens on our every night were showing us it was very stark. Another recommendation, the seventh one, which has been built on again is around trusted people and trusted places, making sure that that there were a, a, a mo different modes of communication to reach people from different, different ethnicities and, and races so that they felt that they could go to information from sources that were relevant and relatable to them or the information was was tailored in a way that was meaningful to them. So the obvious ones is obviously to have them in multiple languages. You know, glad to see we've got a number of resources now in multiple languages that are accessible, including uh, people who, who may also be BSL users. But that wasn't something that was very much in evidence, certainly in the first wave. Another recommendation was to, and a key one, is to have cultural competence at government level. So many of those, if you like, missteps were very much kind of tailored or tiered around the, the lack of this cultural competence, the understanding of uh, the heterogeneity of, of of communities, and although we we acknowledge that the term BAME, BAM, BAME or BAME has had a lot of heat and noise about it, what we wanted to do was actually get on with some actions. We acknowledge in our report that it, it's a, it's a working use, and that's all it was it's done for. Um, but in terms of the the cultural and, and different ethnicities, we understand very clearly that that there needs to be a, a deeper understanding of the differences um, between communities. And, you know, we, you know, we all have our own different, you know, kind of lives that we bring to work and, and our own experiences. Um, a reason, the reason it's referenced is that there was, there's been some recent research by 
Merseyside and Cheshire into vaccine hesitancy and they really did dig down into ethnicity at a, at a real granular level and they looked at age, they looked at um, economic factors, they looked at lifestyle and a whole range of indicators to really understand that heterogeneity of, of, a, of a population. And we would endorse that sort of work going forward to get a much better handle and an understanding because one size does not fit all. Um, going to near the end, the last two are the next, the next uh, recommendation is to have better robust coordination around the health and social care system. So, you know, we're hopefully moving towards integrated care systems now. So we should start to see much more of that um, and not have people falling between the gaps. Uh, and that's regardless of any ethnicity. We know that happens across the board. And then finally, the, the, the recommendation we also wanted to make sure was that any guidance that's produced has clear expectations um, and that's improved to make sure it's the messaging takes account of the needs of, of BAME staff and protects them as well. Only this morning we're still hearing about some concerns from doctors still saying that they haven't had risk assessments. Risk assessments should they they should have all, there should be nobody working in health or social care that hasn't had a risk assessment or had an updated risk assessment. You know this disease has not gone away, and this is a kind of uh, if you like an indicator or a proxy of the disparity. But also you know whether that's through indifference or ignorance or, or inaction, there should not be that sort of, um, if you like, experience for staff who are still being expected to, to sort of put themselves on the line, really. And that goes down to, or, or kind of underscores a lack of trust in systems, organizations at a micro and macro level that many people are feeling, um, if you like, is still very evident despite everything that's happened. Gary, thank you. Covering a great deal of ground there for us to explore. Um, the first issue I'd like to come to is the one that you've, you've just referenced, which is trust, which seems to go to the heart of so much of this discussion and how experience and differential experience, discriminatory experience, impacts on trust. Edwina, could I bring you in now? What is it about the experience of BAM in communities of health and social care, which is undermining their trust in those services and indeed in messages from government. Thank you and good morning everyone. I think from a GP's perspective, one of the things we hear patients say is that the lack of representation of the people that look after them, especially at a senior level, is sort of how do you really understand what I'm going through if you can't imagine where I'm coming from? And I think it's been highlighted the importance of having representative, a representative workforce at, across the board, not just at in your junior doctor nursing level, but right up until consultant level and in leadership positions. So I think that's one thing that we definitely all acknowledge and the Royal College of GPs, a lot of medical schools are working very hard to make sure that they're offering everyone opportunities to be able to work within the health sector so that they're looking after exactly that, people like them, their, their grandmas, their cousins, and their wider communities. Uh, obviously, th there can be situations where patients will attend and feel that they're not really understood. And what we can't, we can't have a workforce necessarily that matches every single person in the community. So the second aspect is training people to understand the differences in cultures, especially in the community they work. So for example, I work in North London, which has diverse communities, but in my little pocket, there's a huge Romanian population, some Jewish populations. So you would expect that some aspects of their culture are, are part of my education, my learning, because they're going to present to me with problems that are related to that. So I think it's a focus on making sure that we we understand the little nuances about the populations that we serve. It's not something that's been thought of in the curriculum before, but like everyone's mentioned, the pandemic has definitely brought to light the differences and experiences, and sadly, you know, negative outcomes for certain ethnicities within the communities, and has put it in sharp relief for everyone that this has to be within the curriculum and preventative. So, so it's sort of we know we know what these people experience, we know what, what we can do to mitigate this, to avoid 
those discrepancies in healthcare in the first place. Thank you. And thank you to people coming through with, with comments on our uh, Q&A function there. There's an, a number of contributions there, um, including a link to the advisory group's recommendations, which, which I, I would strongly encourage you to, to take a look at. Um, Edwina, if you look at the, the recommendations and the experiences that were recorded by the working group, there are a number of people who are saying that the services simply just didn't get their family, they didn't get their family structures, they didn't get where, the way that their family and community and professional services interacted, and that they people were seeing that as a barrier to people understanding their lives and therefore providing them the right services. Is, is, is that a, a fair summation, do you think, of, what, of what's going on? So I definitely think that, and Jerry's mentioned this, that we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach. I think healthcare is getting more complex for many reasons, the aging population, but also the fact that in any one community, you have so much diversity. And I think there's, there's a lot of truth in that statement, actually. I think what we've learned over the last year has been that health and social care can't do this alone. I think that integrated care systems are definitely the future. I think we have to work in collaboration, but I think we need to look beyond health and social care. We need to think about faith organizations, we need to think about the voluntary sectors, we need to think about community associations, because we have to be frank, people already know who they trust. If, we, if it's going to take years to build certain trust in, in, in us, we need to bring on board the people they already trust and work with them. And, and that was certainly a gap that we, we realized all this while we haven't been utilizing. We had the faith communities opening up as vaccination centers. We've had mm -hmm. videos from imams, from, from yeah. priests, from um, temples saying, look at my arm, I've had this done. And you can see straight away how much that's influenced people. So I think it's about thinking about working together now in partnership and realizing we can't be in our silos. We can't reach everyone as, as, an individual, as an individual GP. I can only do so much in 10 minutes, but working collaboratively with all these organizations, I have more pulling power and we can all work together. And I think if people see us working together and they see the leaders that they trust working with us, they're more likely to join in and actually want to engage as well. Jerry, can I just continue that theme about these trusted people and, and places? So Edwina has just been describing how such people can help engender trust in the wider system. Is there a risk that the, particularly the NHS kind of contracts out its understanding of BAM in communities to trusted people, as opposed to making it integral to everything the NHS does? So it's a good question. I think... Oh, so, sorry, uh, can I ask uh, Jerry then, uh, Edwina? Thanks. I think that, you know, commissioning, because I've been a commissioner in a, in a previous role, it's important that commissioning, if you like, an engagement and meaningful engagement is properly resourced. Over the last few years, we've also seen, you know, a number of cuts in local government and, and, and commissioning teams. And those, those were the posts and the roles that often went first because they were seen as soft targets to save money when actually they were the sorts of their roles that if they're used effectively, you can create a conduit, an effective conduit to help uh, speak to different people within communities, within ethnicities, because, you know, we aren't all, you know, coming from the same, you know, same experiences. My experience in, and Edwina's in terms of lifestyle will be quite different. Yes, we're both black women, but, you know, don't make that assumption. And, and there, there is often a sweeping assumption that, oh, as I've taught, spoken to this person, they represent the community. Nobody can. What you do need to have a, a kind of the mechanisms and the vehicles to have, uh, if you like, to build trust, but to actually have that maintained and not taken away when there's where's, when there's an, a, a new budget cutting round, because that's what erodes trust, because people will invest the time into these structures and the social capital, and then it's broken down or it's swept away because there aren't the cut, because there are cuts that undermine the, 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 the infrastructure. So what you need to have is a balance of, Yes, maybe some trusted people, but also to have, you know, develop some networks with different groups that actually, you know, are also heterogeneous and so different ages and races so that people are able to come together because, you know, there is only a finite budget for either social care or health. 
we all have to understand that we need to work we all need to talk and work together but actually the more you engage people in a meaningful way with lived experience the better your services will be because you'll get better use out of them you'll get better outcomes it might take a little bit more time and initially more money up front but all the evidence points to that's what's the best way to do it in a sustainable way Edwina, I think you wanted to come in on that same point. So precisely what Jerry said. And, and we have, I mean, in general practice now, we have people called social prescribers who kind of are like the bridge between the voluntary organisations and lots of other organisations, faith groups, social care and general practice within the community. So for me, it's definitely not, is the NHS going to run a risk of um, outsourcing this to other organisations? I think we need to think about the link between and bringing everyone together, but individually having responsibility for this. Um, we mentioned trust and what we can do within the NHS already in education. Uh, a Zimbabwean medical student has just made a book of skin conditions in a black and darker skin for people to learn how they present in black and darker skin, because guess what? We're taught about all the skin conditions in a certain type of skin. And then when patients come in, with the same skin conditions, we can't actually recognize them or we, we diagnose them late. So this is across the board in healthcare from education and in practice that we're learning to make sure that we're more representative in our teaching. Uh, Edwina, I want to move uh, in a moment onto the issue of, of vaccine hesitancy and what we can learn from that about, about trust and about building relationships. But before that, I want to raise a point that's come up in our Q&A and uh, a question has said that the NHS itself suffers from systemic racism within. There appears to be little appetite for progression to address this. Uh, excuses uh, such as improving representation uh, often seem to be tokenistic. And indeed, there's been a lot of data out recently about the, the race equality standard in the NHS. It's, I mean, stalled would be putting it at its most polite, really, in terms of progress. And there's been, I mean, quite literally decades of reports on this. What's your perspective on the racism and discrimination within the NHS? Because that is surely the beginning of discrimination against service users. Is it moving forward? Is it, are we beginning to solve this issue? I think that is a very difficult question to answer. I think that at the moment, I mean, before, before the, the coronavirus pandemic, we had Black Lives Matter all over the, the world. I think that we have the power of social media. And I think that what's happening now is the fact that people have to acknowledge the racism within the NHS. I think that's the first step. And I think, unfortunately, prior to all of so, this- So you don't think that's happened yet? No, I do think that in the last year, last two right. years, people are beginning to talk about it more. I know that there are steps being taken but for me, and like everybody, I think what we need to see is actual action. We have documents being written. We have scoping exercises being undertaken. It's a first step, isn't it? But what we really want to see is action and evidence that, that people are working towards reducing or eliminating racism within the NHS. Mm. You're asking me the question as a woman and a black woman within the NHS. Yes, there is racism within the NHS. But I think the first step is people actually being saying being honest i think there's been a lot of no we're, we're not you know we, you can't hide now because there's evidence to show that it exists yeah. there's been reports but also it's about seeing visible change because people that's what people want people say they don't trust the system what's what does visible change look like well not just people at lower levels of leadership in the nhs being people from every ethnic minority group but all the way to the top and also within departments, feeling that you're free to speak, not being silenced or bullied. And actually that leadership is so key to me because I think when you see people like you that you can approach and are representing you, then you can start to say that, yes, we, this NHS is for all of us to accomplish our goals and rise up within it, within the ladders of the NHS, regardless of what ethnicity you are. I see the, uh, the book you just mentioned about uh, skin uh, someone's asked, where can we access that? Uh, if I will find a link and put it through to you. If you could, that'd be yeah. ever so helpful. Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah. Yes, I mean, in terms of actual action, I mean, if you look at uh, everything from the uh, representation in the senior ranks of NHS management to discrimination referrals to the General Medical Council, the, the data is pretty pretty static, isn't it, in terms of improvement? Uh, Jill, Jerry, I'd like to come back to you about this issue of vaccine hesitancy. It, the differential impact of this is, is really stark and quite extraordinary. And it's particularly noticeable among BAME workers in, in social care. What is that differential uh, approach to vaccines telling us? Well, I think, you know, the evidence, and, and we've obviously spoken to staff, we've got within our organisation and, and all social care providers that have been doing this, we've provided information, resources, links to webinars and trusted sources and information, but it also reflects the society that we live in as, as racism affects, you know, the NHS and social care. It's, it's indicative of the society we live in. The people that we employ don't just come from the ether, they are part of our society. So they do mirror and reflect good, bad and indifferent our society, but equally the experiences people of, 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 of colour have, black and Asian people in particular, uh, and they've tended to say, you know, to summarise, when you're used to being at the back of the queue or not even in the queue, why are you suddenly being asked to go to the front? Okay. To summarise it in yeah. that sense, that's how a lot of people have felt. So again, it's about the mistrust in, in organisations, in institutions. And equally, you know, when we're talking about health equity, when you've got some of the poor outcomes in maternity, neonatal, neonatal natal care, mental health, I could go on and on, yep. for black and, and some Asian groups, not all, and that's been going on for years. I'm a daughter of somebody from the Windrush generation. My mother worked in the NHS in the 50s and she experienced the racism that's still going on sadly today. So what does that say about our society? Yeah. Now it's not everywhere, but you know, we need to acknowledge that and own that. And, and the uh, leaders of the NHS and social care and their directors need to own that. It's not for black and Asian people to fix. Yes. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. It is about people owning. So I think that, you know, and, and all of this does, you know, go back to trust. Yeah. Now, some of the other reasons people in social care have struggled is partly for very practical reasons. You're being asked to get on a bus to go and get a vaccine when we've been telling people for a year, don't get on a bus. So it's thinking about the, the, the end user, the person, how are they physically going to get that vaccine in their arm? Mm. And if you haven't considered that, and that's across the board, then actually, you know, just saying to people, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're refusing, you're declining, when actually our staff are saying, well, you know, it's it's difficult to kind of get a book, get booked on. Sometimes they try to book and there weren't slots. We found out, you know, when we tried to reach out to some of our GPs, they hadn't got slots available. We also found, you know, some of the, some of the booking systems, if you're not that digitally savvy, some people struggled with it, maybe people's second and third language as well. Again, you know, transport was a big issue when, you know, the survey in, in the Northwest, you know, because we've got black and Asian people up and down the country, all the things that they were saying were resonated for staff in London, in Birmingham, transport, lack of access, being worried about going to an NHS centre to get a vaccine because they were worried of catching COVID. Yes. All those things. So it's not one, again, not one simple silver bullet. You know, and what we're trying to do now is much more personalised, tailor approach. So staff are having one to ones to really understand their reasons for doing it. What we're tending to find now is there's probably a group of people who are, you know, hesitant, maybe disproportionately younger females, and they are concerned about fertility. And perhaps the information that's been out there hasn't given them enough assurance as yet. What we perhaps need to be saying to women is this is a real risk if you get this disease when you're pregnant and what can happen to them because mm. we've had some really sad stories of, of women who've died in pregnancy with covid and they've been disproportionately black and asian thank you and edwina i'd like to pick that point up with you um, about um, appropriate sources of information in just a moment but before that i'd like to come to nick uh, nick I'd be very interested to hear your reflections on our discussion so far, and perhaps do that in the context of the fact that with lasting power of attorney, and I've, I've been through the process some years back, that you are talking to people at their most vulnerable, and it, it's these are such 
big sort of existential issues that you're, you're forced to confront in this quite legalistic framework. And so if you don't trust the institutions of the state which are overseeing that, um, then there's a very uh, plausible, powerful reason for, for not wishing to engage with it. So what, what are your reflections so far, particularly around the issue of trust and engagement with state services? Well, it's very interesting, and, and, and I kind of get the point. I, th I think the, the point the, about a lasting power of attorney is the person you are putting trust in is a person of your choice. It is not the institution of the Office of the Public Guardian. It is not the state. It is, it is someone that you know and trust, and that's really what, what makes it such an, uh, an appealing proposition. No matter, you know, what you think of the world if, if you can say I, I want it to be my son or my daughter that's really what the the lasting power of attorney is all about so and kind of sidestep the issue from trust if people see it for what it is um in terms of our role of the opg yes we we register lasting power of attorneys and we are an institution and you know i, I expect some people are you know are fairly skeptical of that I, I would simply say that all my staff are thinking principally about the user. That, that is how we think about it. We don't think about our role uh, and who pays us. Uh, um, it's about it's about the user. We're focused on them. We are also a massively diverse organisation. So, you know, 49% of my workforce are from the BAME, the BAME, the BAME community, actually. And so I, I would ask people to think, what's, what's an LPA about? It's about putting trust in people you love. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that's how I see it. Um, if, if, you haven't, if you haven't used that strap line of putting trust in people you love, I suggest you do. I think that that would uh, very neatly. Well, if, if people want to have a look at our, our campaign that is particularly focused actually on um, on uh, the BAME community, then have a look at the Your Voice, Your Decision campaign. And it's very much about that. It is about showing, uh, you know, images of, 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 of you know, a mother with with their son that that is what's at the heart of it so if people can help get that that, that across that would be brilliant and we did actually get some funding during covid uh to particularly uh target um underrepresented groups um so we're working on it thank you now edwina this issue of of trusted information uh it's it's really been writ large during during the pandemic and you know those of us who uh, quite happily plow through sort of medical journals and so forth have been brought up short by um, the the sources of information and how quickly wrong information and, and uh, frightening information gets uh, gets spread. And of course, this is in the context of the, the government itself trying to work out what on earth is going on in the early stages and many of its early assumptions themselves being, being proved uh, wrong or certainly incomplete. What can we do to build trusting sources of information and perhaps encourage people to be discerning about where they get their information from? It's a very good question. And, and like we've mentioned a lot about the power of social media, I think mm -hmm. it's useful to contact lots of people all at once. But I think that the media and social media panels need to definitely think about their moderating and their responsibility to, to the public. I think, I think as a doctor and in social care, we've realized that we can't use the traditional methods of communicating with people now and trying to give our views because we're up against lots of campaigns against vaccination, anti-vaxxers from everywhere, it seems. And there's freedom of speech. So it's almost as if we have to make sure that for every voice that says no to the vaccine, we need to be saying actually yes to the vaccine and those reasons, the reasons why. The other thing I find, I find an honest conversation makes a huge difference. When, I'm, when we're honest with patients about what to expect, not sugarcoating things or leaving things out. I think, I think that makes a huge difference. So I think when we say all oh, the, the stats or the vaccines have been taken by X number of people. That doesn't mean very much to the individual person listening on the TV. But I think knowing what to expect helps. Knowing how the vaccines were developed to make sure that no corners were cut helps. And in a simplified format. So how do we how do we tackle the misinformation? Well, we make sure that for every naysayer, where they're saying, yes, actually, I think this is the reason why you should have the vaccine. But in a simple to understand format, 
and giving people the time to ask questions. There'll be lots of webinars, lots of forums where people can go. And I think having health and social care staff on those forums, willing to, to see how they feel, what they think about the vaccine really helps, actually. I, one problem I had with the way the government approached information around the vaccine was that there was no run up to it because people were saying in, in autumn that we need to start work now building trust in this. Um, you know, because you had this figure around like it usually takes 10 years to develop a vaccine. Like, well, it takes two years to get the funding, you know. So it, it, people weren't sort of really understanding what was going on and the extraordinary effort that was going on to make it safe, the extremely high benchmark that's set for vaccine safety. We suddenly said, the vaccine's here, take it. Um, is it we don't seem to be sort of engaging with people we just seem to be firing information at them rather than listening and engaging and responding is that part of the problem completely right and and i think i mean at least in general practice and healthcare in the community where i work we realize that we <clears throat> that whole the gp knows all we just tell people what to do completely defunct and you know, it's now we see ourselves as we were talking about this yesterday on a forum I was on as facilitators of people's care. You know, people know they can access this information. It's our job to be a guide, and part of that is bringing them into the conversation. Jerry's mentioned this co-production, mm. not just expecting to throw something at people, but getting people to to know what's happening behind the scenes safely. Of course, we don't want to just drop them in the deep end, but actually taking them on board with us throughout that journey and having yeah. groups and making sure that as we develop things, we're getting the patient perspective, we're getting the user perspective in social care, in healthcare, the, the, the frontline workers, but also the, the consumers or the, the, the end user as well, throughout the journey, the process, not just at the end. Absolutely. Jerry, on the issue of building trust, of course, you're right in the forefront of this with your own teams and it, you will have been forcibly struck I suspect by the fact that the government is thinking of making it mandatory for social care workers even in advance of health care workers uh, in terms of having a vaccination. I mean, be as blunt as you like what do you think is going on there and on a more positive note what are you doing to build trust among your staff in the vaccination program? So yes that, I mean yes it's very very huge issue for for all social care providers and, and and understandably so so what what we felt um internally is we've got our own BAME forum and our group was were also sharing our concerns but also ideas to help build trust based on what we felt colleagues um were saying to us what we felt or experienced to help help our, our management team and our directors home managers with getting information out so we've created a resource page um, on our, our on our intranet with a number of links which have been updated with new information tailored in different languages from you know a range of kind of trusted credible sources so you know from um, um you know whether it's um there's the caribbean and health uh, african health network they produce helpful videos we know the um uh, I think it's the Muslim Medical Council have a number of uh, other kind of uh, ethnic and cultural and religious organisations have also produced links. So that information has been shared. We've also, you know, in our sort of meetings, our home managers give staff the time and the opportunity to ask questions. Um, we're setting up more one to ones for staff that might want it or need it because they've expressed some concerns. And, and we have seen a gradual slow pickup with, with vaccines week by week when people initially said no, because there's a, there's it's quite interesting. The research from Cheshire and Merseyside did point out that there's around 20 percent of people who are just hesitant or delaying because some of them, again, just wanted to see and watch and see because they were a bit wary. Many of them are starting to come back and have had the vaccine, and that that echoes what's happening in the general public. I see Edwina's nodding, so I think that you know there does need to be that acknowledgement that some people just needed more time, more information. They wanted to wait and see, and they're now saying yes, I can see. You know, obviously we've got however million people who've had this vaccine now, um, and it's it's obviously very very safe, but it's also very effective. We're now seeing that you know we can tailor perhaps the information to people who are. Yeah 
have got additional concerns, maybe because they are female and they're planning a family and it's not unreasonable to expect that. And, and just, you know, just to say, oh, well, so-and-so said it's safe, so you should take it. Actually, you know, what we're trying to make sure we're doing and we are doing is tailoring a more person-centered approach. So we're getting feedback week by week, looking at what people are saying and then tailoring our, the information that we glean um, to that to help that individual make a decision for them because if this is a medical you know <laughs> procedure where although it might take only a few seconds but you're putting something in your body um, and different people have a kind of different you know perception of that because people come with their own views about vaccines anyway you know we know because of flu uptake being highly variable there, 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 there's a difference there so you know this is kind of as, as, as we've alluded to we kind of had the issue where as the saying goes uh, you know a lie was halfway around the world before the truth had got its boots on. Mm. So we've constantly had to catch up with this and we never got ahead of it. We, what we should have done was got to get ahead with the information. Yeah. So what I hope one of the learnings from this is we make sure that we get good trusted information out first and help, as Edwina said, you plan, plan, plan and prepare the ground, buy, get people's buy-in, get their views early on to say, okay, when we get the vaccines ready, how is it, how's, what's the best way to get these into people's arms? Is it going to be a roving bus that we just convert? Because in some areas, that's what we need to do because people haven't got access to cars. They're not going to go on a, they're not going to go on a bus because it's not safe. So it's all those sorts of things. And if you do that, that actually gives people trust to say, oh, they've listened to us. We said this was an issue. They've come back with a solution that we've either suggested or we've come together with a solution. You know, they're taking us seriously. It's about respect. It's about recognition. And, and that's where they're the foundations of, of trust, really. So, and, and indeed, you touched on an important point there about, as you said at the beginning, about place and about having services and access to services, which is unique to that place and understands where and what is uh, required just on the on the the pregnancy point i mean it's fascinating that the the advice changed um from the beginning of the vaccine program and, and then the you know we sort of expect people to turn on the sixpence and exactly and change their own approach to it because the 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 the, the tablet of stone has come down to say it's okay now and life's not like that is it edwina um i'm guessing that you're rather in favour of hearts and minds winning rather than uh, compulsion. Um, when we're looking to, to build confidence, do you, do, you, do you believe that is the right approach, that we, we go slowly, we listen to people, we engage, we, we can't compel, particularly the healthcare workers, health and social care workers? Oh, well, health and social care workers are already in the business of putting themselves on the, on the line for other people. And I think that winning hearts and minds is important for long-term trust and sustainability. I think, I think the only way you can get people's real buy-in is not sort of going, oh, we'll just try this. I think it's really the hearts and minds approach because already the social care workers, the healthcare workers have chosen to do a job, which is basically to serve people, the communities that they live in, that they, they work in. Um, what COVID, the COVID pandemic has shown is that people appreciate what we do, but maybe to our own detriment, we, we sometimes put ourselves on the line and forget you know, about our own health and our own well-being. Mm -hmm. And having leadership that acknowledges that, you know, actually we might have our own questions, we have our own concerns, our own challenges, and giving you the space to discuss that with your, your line manager, your, your team, long term you're going to get the best out of people i think by going through winning their hearts and their minds and i think it's an investment like jerry's mentioned financial time mm. but long term you're going to get the best out of your your team if you use that approach i think i mean i suppose i should should confirm from a kind of organizational point of view we we've obviously went down the you know and we still are with the persuade um heart, win hearts and minds approach however um, we have also taken the view, view that new starters from the 3rd of March are expected to have either had the vaccine or be willing to agree to having the vaccine. Um, I, I do think it's, you know, over time, I think we will, we're hoping to obviously significantly increase those numbers. We've got the vast majority of our, our workforce have been vaccinated, but there also have been practical issues as to why people haven't had the vaccine. It's not just about people saying, no, absolutely not. Some of those reasons do also need to be addressed. 
Great, thanks, John. Um, I would commend our comments. There's uh, some great contributions in the in the comments section um, about these about these issues, and also a good number of of links uh, to various resources, uh, not least the Alzheimer's Society, actually, in terms of. Uh, uh, looking at lasting a power of attorney and, and how you actually address those issues. So drawing towards the last sort of few few minutes of our discussion, uh, Nick, can I come back to you? Um, when you're sort of in your conversations with your uh, your sort of government uh, connections, as it were, what, what messages will you try and communicate to them about building trust? Your colleagues in the Ministry of Justice and elsewhere I think you might overestimate my influence. Uh, <laughs> the conversation has been largely about healthcare. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think it is something that we we um, are really interested in, and I think people are very receptive to. I mean, I, I think I think people understand, and I certainly press the point that you know, government officials sort of promulgating um, information is is not the way to connect with people quite often, um, and that does have an impact. One of the things we've done at OPG that I think. Uh, others will be doing is we, we have our, our LPA partners, which means that we're asking people in all different sort of communities, faith groups, um, healthcare professionals, and so on, actually to to help convey the message of the power of, in our example, an LPA. It might be vaccines elsewhere, and have that sort of proper trusted dialogue. So to understand that you know trust takes time to build, and you need lots of pieces. Um, it's certainly something that um, I often say, and we'll take back. Yeah. And so trusted people are, are very much part of your your approach in terms of building understanding of the... the well, that, absolutely. I mean, the whole, the, yeah. whole, the, whole, the whole system in, in the context of the Medical Capacity Act relies very much on trust. You know, yeah. when people lack capacity, we, we, we don't rip decision-making away from them as far as possible. We yes. don't say we're yeah. going to hand it to an institution. We say as far as possible, that person must be involved. And as far but, as possible... But, but also it, you're, you're working with trusted people in communities to get... Uh, wider understanding of the LPA. We are, and we, we will keep doing. We will keep doing that. Um, we'll keep doing stuff like this. We, we, we'll try all sorts of challenges. My, my ask is, people um, involved in the webinar today is to kind of keep in contact with us and help us do that. Really, um, we, we need as many voices as possible. Yeah, and it matters. I mean, when the, when when you absolutely need it, it is often too late. And uh, it, well, it, it really does matter because, again, if you come back to the trust theme, unfortunately, it, unless we get people to take action and you know empower the people they love to look after them, then the state does the state does step in and largely benevolently so is the truth of it. But but that jars with what people actually want, which is their family, and, yes. and you know, so yeah. Um, Thank. Yeah. So just the uh, last couple of minutes. Um, I can ask uh, Jerry and Edwina to just give us um, a, sort of a minute each on advice on building trust uh, in in health and care services and and the wider state. But two or three hints to people in power who might be listening to this. What, what would you ask them to do, Jerry? Well, we've talked about action, and I've actually kind of created a, a mnemonic, hopefully. So A for the action is accountability. T, uh, C is co-production and collaboration. T is trust, I is being inclusive on a racial basis, but also age, uh, gender, sex, ability, disability. O is focus on outcomes, the so what, you know, you might be spending X on whatever service, but what, what are the outcomes for it across all your population? And, and N is N for the numbers. So you need to sort of see the data and yeah. show me the difference. So outcomes and, and the data in terms of hard data is important so people can see real traction. Hard data, hard outcomes, absolutely. Thank you, Edwina, what would Jerry. your advice be? Jerry, difficult one to follow from. Completely agree with the mnemonic. And for me, I think definitely co-production. Um, leadership across the board that's inclusive and representative. And as, as, a, as a medic, as a doctor, starting from the beginning in education and in training, yeah. making sure culturally competent care, making people aware of what matters to certain societies, especially where they will be working because you can't expect your approach to fit other people. So yeah. that's it for me. And that really needs to be from day one of training, doesn't it? The, the first day of medical school is, is that that's sort of a part of everything that you think about needs to needs to be in that context yeah. can i thank uh, edwina jerry uh, nick and the office of the public guardian for today's discussion 
we've had a very rich discussion and there has been some great contributions online from our audience as well. So I hope people have found it valuable and will take away action points uh, to deliver and push for in their own organisations and lives. So thank you so much for everyone who's participated today and have a good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.